Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello friends, in our earlier class, I focused on the topic introduction to administrative law. In the present lecture, I will focus on the topic definition, meaning and nature of administrative law. Friends, it is very difficult to evolve a satisfactory, universally accepted and precise definition of administrative law, because the administrative law it is considered to be judge made law. Many formulations have been proposed by the different scholars, different exponents of administrative law in UK, in US and other countries, but it seems that all these formulations to the meaning of administrative law these are either too broad or too narrow, meaning thereby that in some definitions we will find that these are so broad that the things or the aspects which should have not been included within the scope of the study of administrative law have been included by the scholars, by the authors who gave the definition and some of these definitions are too narrow, meaning thereby that the some important aspects, the significant features of administrative law which should have been included within the scope of the study of administrative law were not included by those scholars. In defining the administrative law, there are two approaches which are prevalent an American approach to define and understanding the administrative law and an early British approach in defining the administrative law. The American approach to administrative law, it is significantly different from the British approach in defining administrative law. There are two important points on which the American approach differs from the British approach. The American approach lays much emphasis on the procedures of administrative bodies. The American approach acknowledges the administrative law as a separate and independent branch of study and investigation in the area of legal studies and research. And therefore, the American scholars who define the administrative law they made their best efforts to distinguish the area of administrative law and the constitutional law. They tried to separate the administrative law from the constitutional law, whereas the British scholars they could not do so, because of the historical fact that in Britain there was no difference in the administrative law and the constitutional law. Even Dicey who proposed the thesis of rule of law, he was of the opinion in the end of or last decade of 19th century that there was no administrative law in England and neither the English people, they needed any such law as the administrative law because they, they were ruled by the rule of law according to Dicey. And therefore, there is the fundamental difference in the approach in understanding the administrative law, in defining the administrative law by the American scholars and the British scholars. If we refer to an American scholar who defined the administrative law, K. C. Davis, he defines administrative law that the administrative law is the law concerning the powers and procedures of administrative agencies 
including especially the law governing judicial review of administrative action. So, K C Davis defines administrative law as the administrative law is the law concerning the powers and procedures of administrative agencies including especially the law governing judicial review of administrative action. If we try to analyze the definition proposed by K C Davis, it seems that the definition proposed by K C Davis, it excludes the vast multitude of administrative law produced by administration. It excludes vast multitude of substantive law produced by the administration when he is saying that the administrative law is the law concerning the powers and procedures of administrative agencies, he is focusing only on the powers and procedures of administrative agencies and then he excludes the substantive law being produced by the administration. K C Davis in defining the administrative law also includes purely discretionary functions or the pure administrative functions. He used the term administrative agencies and the term used by K C Davis the administrative agencies it is not exhaustive because according to K C Davis the administrative agencies would mean those administrative authorities which are either exercising the adjudicatory functions, the decision making functions or the rule making functions. In other words, the administrative agencies of K C Davis included within them only the administrative bodies performing adjudicatory functions and performing the rule making functions or the functions of delegated legislation. So, he excludes the administrative authorities which do not perform adjudicatory functions or which do not perform the functions of delegated legislation or the rule making functions. In this way, the administrative authorities which are engaged in performing purely administrative functions, the administrative functions simple and pure, these administrative authorities are not included within the meaning of administrative agency by K C Davis. K C Davis further excludes all the control mechanism other than the judicial. He focuses on the judicial review of administrative action. So, only the judicial control over the administrative action or only the mechanism of judicial control was included by K C Davis within the definition of administrative law and he ignored all other control mechanism like the control through the administrative appeals, the control over the administrative action by the process of or the technique of parliamentary or legislative control. He also ignored the control over the administrative action by the boss dog type institutions like the ombudsman etcetera. So, the definition suggested by K C Davis seems not to be precise definition representing the whole scope of the administrative law or the complete sense of the administrative law. The further definition which we are going to discuss, this is the definition of administrative law given by the English scholar Dicey. Dicey defines the administrative law as the law which denotes that portion of nation's legal system which determines the legal status and liabilities of all state officials, which defines the rights and liabilities of all private individuals in their dealings with public officials and which specifies the procedures by which those rights and liabilities are enforced. If we look at the definition proposed by Dicey, it has three components. According to Dicey, the administrative law is the law which determines the legal status and liabilities of all state officials. Number two, the administrative law is the law 
which defines the rights and liabilities of private individuals in their dealings with state officials. Number three, the administrative law is the law which specifies the procedures by which those rights and liabilities are enforced. In defining the administrative law, it seems that the IC excludes the administrative bodies which are not considered to be state officials. The use of the word state officials seems to be very broad including within a scope of it not only the administrative bodies, even such bodies are also included within the state officials which have been established or whose legal status has been defined by the constitution itself. The Dicean formulation to the meaning of administrative law excludes administrative bodies which are not considered to be state officials. It is one pitfall of the definition suggested by Dicey. Dicey excludes the procedures to be followed by administrative authorities. He is focusing only on one procedure that is for the enforcement of rights and liabilities. So, only the judicial control over the administrative action or only the judicial procedure was the point of focus by Dicey in his definition and he excludes that procedural aspect or those procedures which are to be adopted by the administrative bodies in exercising their powers or in performing their functions. Dicean formulation also excludes the control of administrative functioning by legislature and other means when he says that the administrative law is the law which specifies the procedures by which those rights and liabilities are enforced. Again, he is talking about the judicial procedures. It also seems that the Dicean formulation to the meaning of administrative law, it is influenced by the right administrative or the administrative law of France, wherein he was very much obsessed with the diet administrative. We will later on discuss the meaning of diet administrative in detail in today only, but here at this point of time we are concerned only to that feature of administrative diet administrative by which the diocese was obsessed and he was against to the diet administrative wherein two separate series of courts were established in France. So, the diocese was of the opinion that the administrative law or the right administrative was to give the judicial powers to the administration also. It seems that in some aspects the Dicean formulation to the meaning of administrative law is restrictive in the scope to include only judicial control of public officials and only the judicial remedies and on the other hand the Dicean formulation seems also to be broad when he used the term the state officials and he says that the administrative law is the law which determines the legal status and liabilities of all the state officials because the legal status and liabilities of many state officials have already been determined by the constitutional law or it is determined by the constitutional law and therefore, diocese could not separate or distinguish the area of administrative law and the constitutional law in defining administrative law. The further definition which is proposed by Sir Ivor Jennings which is mostly accepted definition of administrative law where he says that the administrative law is the law relating to the administration. It determines the organization, powers and duties of administrative authorities. In this sense, the administrative law is the law which determines the organization, powers and duties of administrative authorities. If we compare the definition given by Dicey with the definition suggested by Sir Ivor Jennings. So, he could make the restrictive definition with reference to the term used by Dicey, the state officials, when he uses the term administrative authorities. But Sir Ivor Jennings excludes the control mechanism in his definition 
he excludes the procedure of administrative authorities he also failed to distinguish the administrative law from the constitutional law in this respect griffith and street who are the renowned exponents of english administrative law they also criticized iver jennings definition or iver jennings formulation by giving an example that how a minister of housing and litigation is appointed it is not the concern of the student of administrative law that is the matter of constitutional law but when the minister is approving any scheme of township and the rights and liabilities rights and liberties or the freedoms of individuals are affected by this scheme then the role of administrative law starts so griffith and street say that appointment of minister this is not the concern of administrative law and therefore the organization and powers of all the administrative authorities it is not necessarily or essentially the concern of administrative law but the functioning of such officials is always the concern of administrative law baird and phillips also define the administrative law baird and phillips say that the administrative law is a law is the branch of public law which is concerned with the powers duties rights and liabilities of the various organs of government which are engaged in the administration so dicey baird and phillips they say that administrative law is the law or it is the branch of public law which is concerned with the powers the duties the rights and liabilities of various organs of the government which are engaged in administration he tried to specify the scope of administrative law he tried to confine the scope of study of administrative law only to the powers duties rights and liabilities of various organs of the government which are engaged in administration so he tried to distinguish between the administrative law and the constitutional law it seems that wade and phillips also defined the administrative law on the similar lines as it is defined by sir iver jennings professor upendra vaksi the renowned legal scholar in india he also tried to define the administrative law and he defines the administrative law is a study of the pathology of power in developing societies he says the administrative law is the pathology of power the administrative law is the law where the investigation of the exercise of public power is made we know the role of pathology where by means of various investigations the problem of disease or the cause of disease is discovered and the disease can be defeated only when the root cause of that disease is investigated or it is discovered by the investigations in pathology similarly the administrative law is the pathology of power so all the disease in the area of the exercise of public power it can be remedied only when the effective investigations are made and the root causes of such diseases in the area of exercise of public power are discovered in this sense professor upendra vaksi he emphasizes on the protection of a little man against the arbitrary exercise of public power the great exponent to of administrative law in england griffith and street also defined the administrative law when they criticize the definition proposed by dicey they also tried to define the administrative law in defining the administrative law griffith and street posed three important questions number 1 what are the powers does the administration exercise number 2 what are the limits of these powers and number 3 what are the ways 
by which the administration can be kept within these limits. According to Griffith and Street, the administrative law is the law which gives the answer to all these three questions. The administrative law is the law which tells us that what are the powers to be exercised by the administration, what are the limits of those powers and what are the way outs, what are the means by which the administration can be kept within these defined limits. Griffith and Street pose these three questions, but it seems that the definition searched by Griffith and Street is also not complete. To give the full sense of the administrative law or to make one understand about the subject matter, the content or the complete scope of the administrative law. And therefore, in 1968, the Indian Law Institute organized a seminar on the topic, the cases and material on administrative law in India. As to the conclusion of that seminar, the ILI, the Indian Law Institute posed two more questions to aid these with the questions posed by Griffith and Street to make the definition of administrative law more complete and more precise. The two important questions posed by Indian Law Institute as the conclusion of that seminar, that conference were number one, what are the procedures to be followed by the administrative authorities in exercising their powers and number two, what are the remedies based the, which are available to a person whose rights are infringed by the operation of the administration. These two questions were posed by the Indian Law Institute and according to the conclusion drawn by the Indian Law Institute of the seminar on the topic, the cases and materials on administrative law in India. The administrative law is the law which provides for the procedure to be followed by administrative authorities in exercising their powers and the administrative law is the law which provides for or which tells us about the remedies which are available to a person whose rights are infringed by the operation of the administration. If these two questions are added to the definition proposed by Griffith and Street, then the administrative law becomes the law which gives the answer to five questions. Number one, what are the powers does the administration exercise? Number two, what are the limits of these powers? Number three, what are the ways? What are the means? What are the way outs? What are the mechanism by which the administration can be kept within the defined limits of its power? Number four, what are the procedures to be followed by the administrative authorities? in exercising their powers and in performing their functions. Number five, what are the remedies which are available to a person whose rights are infringed by the operation of the administration? If we look at this combined formulation to the meaning of rule of law, to the definition of rule of law, the definition proposed by Griffith and State and the definition proposed by Indian Law Institute. It seems that it gives a complete sense to the content of administrative law, to the scope of administrative law, to the subject matter being studied or to be studied under the domain of administrative law. It is also relevant to note that we have analyzed different definitions or formulations suggested by different scholars and we found that Dicey and other scholars in defining the administrative law, they ignored the procedure 
all the procedures to be followed by the administrative bodies were not included within the meaning of the administrative law within the scope of a study of administrative law. But here we say that all those aspects of the administration which are in any way relating to or which may affect the rights and freedoms of the individuals are included within the scheme within the scope of the administrative law. So, administrative law becomes the law which tells us about the powers of the administration, about the limits of powers of the administration, about the means and payouts by which the administration can be kept within the defined limits, which tells us about the procedures which are to be adopted by the administration during the performance of functions or the exercise of powers and the administrative law is the law which provides for, which tells us, which discovers about the remedies which must be available to a person if his rights are infringed or violated by the operation of the administration. On the basis of these all the definitions suggested by different scholars to the meaning of administrative law, the administrative law deals with number one the structure, the powers and the functions of different organs of the administration, not different organs of the state, not different organs of the government as we know that the organs of the state or the organs of the government also include the legislature and the judiciary. So, the administrative law deals with the structure, the powers and functions of different organs of administration. Number two, the administrative law deals with the limits of the powers of the administration. The administrative law deals with various means and procedures to be followed by the administrative authorities or the administrative officials or the administrative agencies during the exercise of their powers, during the performance of their functions. The administrative law also deals with the different control mechanism by which the powers of the administration are controlled. These may be the procedural control, the judicial control, the legislative control, the control by some other institutions like ombudsman, like Lokpal, like Lokayukt, etcetera. One important aspect to which the administrative law deals is the legal remedies which are available to a person against the administrative authorities. There may also be the distinction in the public administration and the administrative law. K. C. Davis in his definition distinguishes between the area of the public administration and the administrative law. He says that the administrative agencies would mean only those administrative bodies which are either performing or exercising the adjudicatory functions or the legislative functions. All other aspects of administrative bodies they go to the domain of public administration. Constitutional law and administrative law these are two very closely related subjects and therefore, it is very difficult to differentiate or to distinguish between the area of administrative law and the area of constitutional law. Basically, there are two kinds of laws public law and private law. Public laws are the laws which regulate the state or the laws by which the state is regulated fall within the domain of within the category of public law. Whereas, the laws by which the state regulates the individuals are considered to be the private law. The administrative law being the branch of public law is very closely connected with the constitutional law 
and that was the reason that earlier there was no difference, there was no distinction in the administrative law and the constitutional law, both were considered to be the same. Keith, who is very renowned legal scholar, he says that it is logically impossible to distinguish administrative law from constitutional law and all attempts to do so are artificial. Just look at the statement made by Keith that it is logically impossible to distinguish administrative law from constitutional law. And number two, all attempts to distinguish administrative law from the constitutional law are artificial. This statement of Keith or this understanding of Keith to both the subjects, to both the areas, the constitutional law and the administrative law indicates that administrative law and the constitutional law are so closely connected both being the branch of public law that one cannot be distinguished from the other. And any effort to distinguish between these two, it is always artificial, it is not real. But in 20th century, due to the transformation of the concept of a state from laissez-faire to welfare the state, transformation from laissez-faire concept of a state to the welfare concept of a state, the administrative law assumed an independent and separate recognition from the constitutional law and it became to be considered as separate branch of study and research. It means that though these two subjects are very closely related, but certainly there are basic difference or points of distinction in these two. In this regard, Holland says that constitutional law describes various organs of the government at rest, while the administrative law describes them in motion. Jennings is of the opinion that administrative law deals with the organization, functions, powers, duties of administrative authorities, while the constitutional law deals with the general principles relating to these aspects of administrative authorities. So, the general principles relating to the organization of administrative authorities general principles as to the function, powers, duties of administrative authorities are always laid down by the constitutional law, whereas the details of all these aspects relate to the administrative law. Holland seems to be correct in saying that constitutional law describes various organs of the government at rest, whereas the administrative law describes them in motion. We can understand it by referring to criticism made by Griffith and Street to the formulation to the given by Sir Ivor Jennings to the meaning of administrative law. When they said that it is not the concern of a student of administrative law to go into the details of the question that how a minister is appointed. The concern of administrative law is only when that minister approves any scheme of township and rehabilitation, wherein the rights of a person are affected. So, certainly the constitutional law describes various organs of the government at rest and the administrative law describes them in motion. We can also see the difference in the administrative law or the constitutional law as to their sources. The source of constitutional law is the constitution or the provisions of the constitutional law itself, whereas the source of the administrative law is the statutory law, the precedents, etcetera. 
the source of constitutional law is only the constitution and constitutional conventions or those basic precedents fundamental or illustrious precedents wherein the interpretation of any relevant provision of constitution is made. But the source of administrative law is the statutory law, the source of administrative law may also be the administrative directions etcetera. It seems that the area of administrative law and the area of constitutional law absolutely cannot be distinguished. It is not possible to demarcate the area of these two subjects. It is impossible to make any watertight compartments for the area of administrative law and the area of constitutional law to put. There is always the watershed in the administrative law. If we draw two circles, when you will go through your books of administrative law, you will find that the authors, they, they try to make you understand to this point by drawing two circles. And there is always a portion which is overlapping. This overlapping portion of these two circles of denoting the administrative law and the constitutional law is called as watershed in administrative law. This watershed in the administrative law and particularly in Indian administrative law can be understood by referring to certain principles, to certain aspects which we study in both the papers, the constitutional law and the administrative law. The concept of rule of law, it is the subject matter of the constitutional law as well of the administrative law. We study the doctrine of separation of powers in both the subjects. The doctrine of separation of powers is the subject of study within the scope of both the administrative law and the constitutional law. Right to information, other fundamental rights, you can see the watershed in administrative law in India or the watershed in Indian administrative law in the form of article 32 of our constitution. Article 32 of Indian constitution provides for the authority of the Supreme Court to issue the writs to make the judicial review or to entertain the claims of violation of fundamental rights directly. One can go to the Supreme Court of India under article 32 for the enforcement of any fundamental rights. Article 136, the grant of a special leave petition for making to appeal to the Supreme Court. Article 226, 227, the appellate jurisdiction of the High Court and writ jurisdiction of the High Court. Article 300 is also very good example of this watershed in Indian administrative law. Under Article 300 of the Constitution, the tortious liability of state is provided. And this Article 300 or this, this topic of tortious liability of state, tortious liability of government, it is a subject matter of study in both the papers, the administrative law and the constitutional law. You can also refer to Article 311. Article 263 the interstate councils article 280 of indian constitution finance commission of india article 202 interstate water dispute authority article 315 the union public service commission article 329 the election commission of india all these are the references of the watershed of Indian administrative law. So, the area of administrative law and the constitutional law, they cannot very precisely be distinguished. There is always the overlapping of the subject matter being to be dealt or to be studied under the scope of administrative law 
and the constitutional law. That is the reason that in the administrative law we always study some important aspects of the constitutional law like the rule of law, the topic of separation of powers, the topic of the writ jurisdiction or the judicial review of the administrative action etcetera. After discussing the definition, meaning and scope of administrative law along with the points of distinction or more precisely or more appropriately the relationship in the constitutional law and the administrative law. There is one more important aspect to be discussed at the same point of time, the Dwight administrative. I referred to this Dwight administrative when I was discussing the definition proposed by Dicey by saying that Dicey was very much obsessed with the French administrative law and we can see the direct influence of the Dwight administrative on the formulation to the meaning of rule of law proposed by Dicey. What is the Dwight administrative? Dwight administrative simply means the system of French administrative law. Dwight administrative can be defined, can be explained as the French administrative law which is a body of rules which determines the organization, powers and duties of public administration and which regulate the relation of the administration with the citizens of the state. This is the meaning of Dwight administrative. The Dwight administrative does not represent the rules and principles enacted by the parliament. It contains the rules developed by the administrative courts. How did this Dwight administrative emerge and develop in France? It is the matter of historical development in France. In pre-revolutionary France, before the revolution, there were two contesting groups. The reformist parliament who supported the jurisdiction of ordinary courts, the civil courts and other one was the traditional Bonapartist who supported the executive power even in the hands of executive. These were the two contesting groups. When Napoleon Bonaparte became the ruler in France, he abolished the organization of body which was there, the Council de Roy. Council de Roy, it was created to advise the king in legal and administrative matters. This Council de Roy also discharging judicial functions such as deciding the matters between great novels. Napoleon Bonaparte, he abolished this body and created Council d'Etat for advising the ministers in discharging their administrative and judicial functions, quasi judicial functions. Later on during the course of time in France, the separate series of courts, administrative courts developed and this council d'etat, it became the superior most court among the, among all the administrative courts. The important feature of the Dwight administrative in England, in France was that this system of Dwight administrative or the administrative courts, they did not apply the law enacted by the ordinary legislature. So, there were two important features 
due to which the IC was against this administrative development in France. Number one, that the ordinary law civil, law civil or the law being enacted by the competent legislature was not being adopted, was not being followed by the system of Deutsch administrative by the administrative courts in France. And number two, for dealing with the disputes between the administration and the individuals or administration per se, the separate series of courts were there. The ordinary civil court did not have the jurisdiction over the administrative matters. The administrative matters could be decided, could be dealt with only by the administrative courts in France. Dicey was very critical to this system because under his thesis of rule of law, he insisted on, he emphasized on the supremacy of law and the equality before law. He was of the firm opinion that everybody irrespective of his status and rank should be subjected to the jurisdiction of ordinary courts and should be regulated by the ordinary law or the law being enacted by the competent legislature. So, he was not convinced with the system of Dwight administrative because of these two reasons that Dwight administrative did not represent the law civil or he did not adopt or he was not following the law being made by the competent legislature. Then the question arises that if the system of Dwight administrative or these administrative courts, these were not adopting or following the law civil, then what were the procedures, what was the law to be followed by, to be adopted by these administrative courts during the performance of their functions. The answer is that the legal principles and the legal rules being developed by these administrative courts by themselves during their course of functioning were being adopted by, were being followed by these administrative courts. So, the right administrative was the system wherein the administrative body that is the council d'etat which was initially created as the administrative body later on started to enjoy or exercise threefold functions. The administrative functions, the judicial functions and also the legislative functions and that was the reason that diocese was very critical or opposite to this development wherein one branch of the government that is the administration or the executive becomes the repository of all three kinds of functions and it is according to the opinion of diocese goes contrary to the basic spirit of the rule of law and therefore, he was opposite to this system of Dwight administrative in England. With respect to the Dwight administrative and Dicean criticism of the system of Dwight administrative, it is also relevant to know that though Dicey criticized the Dwight administrative or French administrative law for some regions that the Dwight administrative was the system to confer more and more powers on the administration or executive branch of the government. Among the others, but it is also the fact that in the history of France, all the legal developments which were made, no institution could do such a 
betterment for the people of France as the Dwight administrative could do, because within the system of Dwight administrative, there were different kinds of rules and in these rules, the rules dealing with the administrative authorities and officials, rules dealing with the operation of public services to meet the need of citizens and the rules dealing with the administrative adjudication. So, this is very important aspect of the rules being developed by the Dwight administrative, the rules dealing with the operation of public services to meet the need of citizens. So, two important features, number one the separate rules dealing with the operation of public services to meet the need of citizens could do better for the people of France and the rules relating to the administrative adjudication, the separate system of administrative courts, it could succeed in giving the speedy resolution of the controversies, differences or the disputes where the administration was involved and it could do better for giving the justice to the citizens against the administration or the state itself. So, there is the great contribution of this system of Dwight administrative for the protection of the freedoms, the rights and liberties of the people in France. The IC could not do that internal aspect of the Dwight administrative, he could do only the, the outer appearance of Dwight administrative. So, if it is said that the IC could not understand the Dwight administrative in its reality or he misunderstood the Dwight administrative only by seeing its outer appearance or structure, not its detailed functioning and its contribution to preserve the basic rights, freedoms and liberties of the people, it would be correct. So, in this lecture, we discuss the meaning, definition of administrative law, the scope of administrative law, the relationship of the administrative law with the constitutional law and then the system of Dwight administrative in France. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Gillette Sam uh, and I teach uh, sociology at IIT Kanpur. Uh, today I am going to tell you about uh, the different characteristics uh, of the movement of things uh, around the world that are associated with globalization. Uh, we refer to these kind of movements as global flows. Now, um, the concept of global flows uh, is quite important and it is important for us to understand the uh, different ways in which these flows might occur. Now, typically uh, when people talk about uh, the movement of uh, things from one place to another in, uh, in the context of globalization, uh, they are under the misconception that things tend to flow uh, from abroad into the place where they are living. Uh, in a, in a very sort of st stereotypical manner, uh, there is this idea that with globalization, much of the movement that occurs is from western countries into non-western countries. Now, uh, as sociologists, we know that uh, actually global flows are multidirectional. 
So which means that as much as there is a movement of flows from western countries into non-western countries, uh, there is an equal amount of movement uh, of flows from one non-western country to another non-western country and in fact uh, a movement of flows from non-western countries into western countries as well. Uh, let us take the example of food for instance. Uh, you may be aware of uh, a type of food uh, which originated uh, actually in China and then goes on to Japan uh, called ramen. Uh, for instance, uh, the popular brand Top Ramen that is consumed in India is an example of ramen. Now uh, ramen initially the movement is from China which is a non-western country to Japan which is another non-western country. From Japan uh, this very popular food item travels to western countries uh, such as uh, the US and also more recently to countries in Europe. Uh, so there you have a movement from a non-western country to a western country and in fact now we have uh, uh, very specific types of ramen uh, being consumed in metropolitan centers in India as well. So there is another movement from a western country to a non-western country which is India. So global flows uh, in that sense are multidirectional. Uh, a second aspect of global flows is that they could be interconnected. Um, and in, uh, uh, an easy way to think about this uh, would be um, if you have relatives who are traveling from um, the US or the UK or Australia, uh, very often uh, you see that people request them to carry electronic items with them. Uh, they say, oh, can you please get me a laptop or can you please uh, get me the specific camera lens that I am looking for. Uh, so here you see that uh, the movement of people, which is a person moving from one country to another country, is connected to the movement of uh, technological items as well. So global flows in that sense are interconnected with each other. A third characteristic of global flows is that we could see that uh, they happen in reverse. Uh, in fact, they are called reverse global flows. Uh, an example of a reverse global flow would be um, a, a style of music that uh, you may be very well acquainted with, uh, which is Bhangra. Now, Bhangra music uh, is something that originated, uh, as we know, in uh, the state of Punjab. Now, as you know, the, uh, Punjab is also uh, a state which has seen a lot of out-migration, not only to other parts of India, but also to other parts of the world. Uh, so as people migrated to other parts of the world, they took their music with them. So uh, when uh, people migrated from Punjab to the UK, for instance, uh, they hung on to the music that they were familiar with. So Bhangra moved from uh, uh, little villages in Punjab to the major uh, cities where people from Punjab settled to in the UK. While in the UK, uh, over subsequent generations, this music was transformed. Uh, it was not only performed in its original version, but it was also performed uh, with the addition of many different types of beats which are more familiar to people in the UK. At one point in time, you see that this, uh, this modified form of Bhangra comes back to India. We are talking about the 1990s, the, the 2000s. So here you see that, uh, um, that a form of music that originated in India moves out of India to the UK. It is modified a little and then comes back to become extremely popular uh, in India again. So this so in some ways this form of music is returning to where it started out but in a slightly changed manner. We call this kind of movement as a reverse flow.